Hello. Today's reading will be chapters 15 through 17 of Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. Chapter 15, Amari. I used to dream of climbing. Late at night, when everyone in the palace had gone to sleep, Binta and I would run through the painted halls by torchlight, skidding over the tiled floors in our trek to Father's war room. Hand in hand, we drew the torch over the hand-woven map of Arisha, a map that seemed as large as life itself to our young eyes. I thought Binta and I would see the world together. I thought if we left the palace, we could be happy. Now, as I cling to the side of the third mountain we've climbed today, I question why I ever dreamed of ascending anything higher than the palace stairwell. Sweat clings to my skin, soaking through the rough cloak of my black dashiki. An endless swarm of mosquitoes buzz and sting at my back, feasting because I can't bear to let go of the mountain long enough to swat them away. Another full day of travel has passed, along with, thankfully, one night of restless, restful sleep. Though the weather warmed once we left Sokoto and made our way further into the jungle, I felt Zane lay his cloak over me again just as I began to fall asleep. With our new supplies, eating comes easy. Even foxer meat and coconut milk start to taste like seasoned hen from the palace kitchen. I thought things were finally improving, but now my chest is so tight I can barely breathe. This late into the day, we've ascended thousands of meters, giving us startling views of the jungle beneath. Greens of all hues cover the land, creating endless canopies beneath our feet. A rushing river curves through the tropical bush, brush, marking the only water in sight. It grows smaller and smaller as we climb, shrinking until it's only a thin blue line. How can anything exist up here, I ask in between pants. I take a deep breath and I give the rock above my head a firm pull. Earlier in our journey, I wouldn't test my handholds. My scraped knees are a reminder not to repeat that mistake. When the rock holds firm, I hoist myself further up the mountain, wedging my bare feet into a crack. The urge to cry wells up inside me, but I force it down. I've already hidden my tears twice. It would be humiliating to weep again. She's right, Zane calls from behind me, searching for an area wide enough for Nala to clamber up. Their lion air is skittish after almost slipping off the last mountain. Now she climbs only after Zane proves it's safe. Just keep going, Zane calls from above. It's here. It has to be here. Did you actually see it? Zane asked. I think back to the moment in Mama Hag Agva's hut. The moment the future exploded before our eyes. It all looked so magical back then. Stealing the scroll actually felt like a good idea. We saw ourselves climbing, I start. But did you see this legendary temple? Zane presses, just because Mama Agba saw us climbing doesn't mean Chan Noble's actually real. Stop talking and keep climbing, Zelly shouts. Trust me, I know it's real. It's the same reasoning she's been shouting all day, the stubbornness that's carried us from cliff to cliff. Reality and logic don't matter to her. She needs this so badly. Failure isn't even in the realm of possibilities. I look down to reply to Zane, but the sight of jungle trees thousands of meters below makes my muscles seize. I press my body against the mountain and clench the rocks tightly. Hey, Zane calls. Don't look down. You're doing great. You're lying. He almost smiles. Just keep climbing. My beating pulse fills my ears as I look back up. The next ledge is in sight. Though my legs shake, I push myself farther up. Sweet skies, if Binta could see me now. Her beautiful face bleeds into my mind in all its former glory. For the first time since I watched her die, I picture her alive, smiling and by my side. There was one night in the war room when she undid her bonnet and her ivory hair felt in silky sheets around her head. And what shall you wear when we cross the Olasimbo Ridge? Rain, she, she teased when I told her my plans for our escape to the Ade, Adetunji Sea. Even if you were on the run, the queen herself would drop dead before she allowed you to wear trousers. She put her hand on her head and pretended to shriek, mimicking mother's pitch. I laughed so hard that night that I nearly wet myself. Despite the circumstances, a smile comes to my face. Binta could impersonate everybody in the palace. Yet my file, smile falls as I think of our lost dreams and abandoned plans. I thought we could escape through the tunnels beneath the palace. Once we got out, we would never go back. It all felt so certain in that moment, but did Binta always know it was a dream she'd never see? The question haunts me as I reach the next ledge and pull myself over. The mountain flattens out for a brief stretch, wide enough for me to lie down in the wild grass. 
and as I drop to my knees, Zelly collapses in a garden of native bromelades, crushing the vibrant red and purple petals under her feet. I bend down and breathe in their sweet scent. Binta would have loved these. Can we stay here? I ask as the clove fragrance calms me. I can't imagine climbing any higher. The promise of Chen Noble can only take us so far. I lift my head as Nala claws her way onto the ledge. Zane follows after, dripping with sweat. He peels off his sleeveless dashiki and I lower my eyes. The last time I saw a boy's bare body, my nannies were giving an on in me baths. A warm flush rises to my cheeks as I realize how far from the palace I've truly come. Although it's not illegal for royals and Kosidan to consort the way it is for Maji and Kosidan, Mother would have Zane jailed for what he'd just done. I scoot away, eager to put more space between Zane's bare skin and my blushing face, but as I move, my fingers knock against something smooth and hollow. I turn and find myself face to face with a cracked skull. Skies, I shout, and I crawl backward, hairs rising on the nape of my neck. Zelly jumps to her feet and expands her staff, ready to fight at a moment's notice. What is it, she asks. I point to the fractured skull lying on top of a pile of crushed bones. A gaping hole above its eye socket signals its violent death. Could it be another climber, I ask? Someone who did not make it through? No, Zelly answers with a strange confidence. It's not that. She tilts her head and bends down for a closer look. A chill passes through the air. Zelly reaches down, stretching her hand out toward the cracked bone. Her fingers barely graze the skull when... I gasp as the sweltering jungle heat around us snaps to a freezing cold. The chill bites through my skin, cutting straight to the bone, but the icy rush only lasts an instant. As quick as it comes... It vanishes, leaving us bewildered on the mountainside. Ugh! Zelly wheezes like she's been brought back to life. She grips the bromelade so tightly the flowers rip straight off their stems. What in God's name was that? Zane asks. Zelly shakes her head, eyes growing wider and wider by the second. I felt him. It was his spirit, his life. Magic, I realize. No matter how many times I see it, the displays never fail to conflict me. Even as father's childhood warnings of magic resurface, my heart fills with awe. Come on, Zelly dashes forward, scurrying up the next incline. That was stronger than anything I've ever felt. The temple has to be near. I scramble after her, casting aside my fear and my desire to reach the last ledge. And when I pull myself up over the final cliff, I can't believe my eyes. Chand Noble. It's actually here. Moss-covered bricks are piled in mountains of rubble coating every inch of the plateau. The destruction is all that remains of the temples and shrines that once covered this land. Unlike the jungle and mountains below, no crickets chirp, no birds squawk, no mosquitoes sing. The only signs that life ever existed are the shattered skulls littered around our feet. Zelly pauses before a skull, brows knitting, though nothing happens. What is it, I ask? It's spirit, she bends down. It's rising. Rising where, I step back. Stumbling over a piece of rubble, another chill fills me with an unspoken dread, but I can't decipher it. If it's just real or just in my head, I don't know. Zelly rubs her neck. Something about the temple is amplifying my ash. I can actually feel my magic. And before I can ask another question, Zelly bends down and touches another skull. My hand flies to my chest, but this time it's not an icy cold that flashes around her, but an image tinted in gold. Magnificent temples and towers rise. Stunning structures adorned with elegant waterfalls. Dark men, women, and children in fine suede robes roam. Beautiful lines and symbols dotting their skin in elegant swirls of white. Though the flash lasts only an instant, the image of the lush grounds stains my memory as I look at the broken rubble before me. Chand Noble used to be radiant. Now it's only air. What do you think happened here, I asked Zelly, though I fear I already know. Father destroyed the beauty of magic in my life. Why wouldn't he have done the same throughout the world? I wait for Zelly to answer, but she doesn't respond. Her face hardens with each passing second. She can sing more, something I can't. A soft lavender light begins to glow from her fingers, surfacing as she explores her powers for the first time. Watching her, my curiosity builds. What else can she see? Though the thought of magic still makes my pulse race, Part of me wishes I could experience its rush just once, 
the rainbow that bursts from Binta's hand, begins to fill my mind until I hear Zane call, Check this out! We follow Zane's voice until we're facing the only standing structure on the mountain. The temple towers into the sky, built against the ledge of the last rock's incline. Unlike the stone bricks, this structure is crafted from blackened metal, streaked with yellows and pinks that suggest it once shone gold. Vines and moss grow up the sides, obscuring endless rows of ancient runes carved into the temple's frieze. Zelly moves towards the doorless entrance, but Nala lets out a small growl. Okay, Nala. Zelly gives her nose a kiss. Stay here, all right. Nala grunts and she collapses behind a pile of broken stone. With Nala settled, we walk through the opening and greet a magical aura so thick, even I can feel its weight in the room. Zane scoots closer to Zelly. As I run my hand against the air, the oscillations of magical energy slip through my fingers like grains of falling sand. Rays of light peek through the cracked oculus above, illuminating the patterned dome ceiling. The designs feed into rows of pillars decorated with colored glass and shimmering crystals. Why didn't they destroy this, I wonder, as I run my fingers along the carvings. The temple is strangely untouched, a lone tree in a scorched forest. See any doors? Zane calls from the other side of the room. Nothing, Zelly calls back. The only visible fixture is a large statue pressed against the black back wall, collecting dust and overgrown vines. We walk over, and Zane runs his hands over the weathered stone. The statue appears to be that of an elderly woman cloaked in rich robes. A golden crown sits in her sculpted white coils, the only untarnished metal in sight. Is it a goddess, I ask, inspecting the sculpture up close. In all my years, I've never seen a single rendering of a single deity. No one would dare place one in the palace. I always assumed the first time I saw a god or goddess, it would be depicted, depicted like the royal portraits hanging in the main hall, but despite its varnish, this statue holds a regal air even the most stunning paint, painting couldn't achieve. What's this? Zane points to an object in the woman's hand. Looks like a horn. Zelly reaches up to inspect it. It's strange. She runs her hand across its rust, rust, rusted metal. I can almost hear it in my head. What's it saying, I ask? It's a horn, Amari. It's not saying anything. My cheeks flush. Well, if it's a sculpture, it shouldn't be making sounds at all. Just be quiet. Zelly hushes me and places both hands on the metal. I think it's trying to tell me something. I hold my breath as her brows pinch, and after a few long moments, her hands begin to glow with a glittering silver light. The horn seems to feed on her ash, glowing brighter as she strains. Be careful, Zane warns. I am, Zelly nods, though she begins to shake. It's close. It just needs one more push. A slow creak rumbles under our feet. I yelp at the door at the sound. We whip around in surprise as a large tile slides away from the floor. The opening reveals a staircase spiraling down into a room so dark it masks everything in blackness. Is it safe? I whisper. The darkness makes my heartbeat spike. I lean down to get a better look, but there isn't a source of light in sight. There's no other door, Zelly shrugs. What choice do we have? Zane runs outside, returning with a charred femur bone wrapped in a torn bit of his cloak. Zelly and I recoil, but he brushes past us and lights the cloth with our flint, creating a makeshift torch. Follow me, he says, his commanding voice diminishing my fear. We begin our descent with Zane leaving, leading the way, though the torch's bubble of light illuminates our steps. It touches nothing more. I keep a hand on the jagged wall, counting my breaths until we finally reach the next floor. The moment my foot leaves the last step, the opening above us slams shut with a deafening crack. Skies! My shriek rings through the darkness. I fling myself into Zelly. What do we do now, I tremble? How do we get out of here? Zane turns to run back up the stairs, but stops when we hear a hissing in the air. Within seconds, his torch blows out, leaving us in total blackness. Zane, Zelly shouts. The hiss grows louder until a warm gust of air hits me like rain. When I inhale, it instantly slows my muscles and then begins to cloud my mind. Poison, Zane manages to croak before I hear the thud of his body hitting the ground. I don't even have a chance to feel afraid before the darkness takes hold. Chapter 16, Inan. So remembering that Inan is actually Amari's brother, the prince. A hush cuts through the air when my legion 
descends into Sokoto, so Sokoto. Doesn't take long to figure out why. We're the only guards in sight. Where are the patrols? I whisper to Kea. The silence is deafening. It's like these people have never laid eyes on the Orishan seal. Skies only knows what father would do if he witnessed their complete lack of respect. We dismount our riders by a lake so clear it reflects the surrounding trees like a mirror. Lula gnashes her teeth at a group of children, and they scamper away as she takes a drink. We don't post guards at traveling settlements. It would be a waste when the residents change every few days. Kea unlashes her helmet, and the wind runs through her hair. My scalp itches to feel the same, but I have to keep my white streak hidden. Find her, I inhale the clean, brisk air, trying to forget about my streak, if only for a moment. Unlike this heat and the smog of Lagos, the small settlement is fresh, revitalizing. The cool breath dulls the burn in my chest as I try to keep my curse down, but my pulse races as I scan the surrounding diviners. I've been so focused on ending the girl, girl I didn't stop to think of how she could end me. I grip the hilt of my sword as my eyes flick from diviner to diviner. I've yet to see the extent of the girl's magic. How would I defend against her attack? And what if she fights with her words? A prick of terror hits. The magic inside me spikes. All she'd have to do was point to my helmet, identify the curse beneath. Kea would see my white streak. My secret would be out for the world to see. Focus in on. I close my eyes, holding the warm senate pond tight. I can't keep spiraling. I have to fulfill my duty. Arisha is still under attack. As the numbers force order into my head, I reach for the curved handle of my throwing knife. Magic or not, the right throw will disarm her. A sharp blade will still cut through her chest. But for all my plotting and maneuvering, it's obvious the girl isn't here. Though there's no shortage of glaring diviners, her silver gaze is not among them. I release the throwing knife as something I can't place deflates in my chest. It sinks like disappointment. It breathes like relief. Take these posters, Kea instructs the shoulder. soldiers. She hands each of the ten men a roll of parchment inked with a girl's smug face. Find out if anyone has seen her or a bullhorned lion air. Usually don't find them so close to our coast. Kea turns to me, lips pursed in determination. We'll search the merchants. If they really come south, came south, this would be the first place to gather supplies. I nod and try to relax, but being this close to Kea makes it impossible. Every little movement catches her eye, each sound practically makes her ears twitch, and as I walk behind her, the strain of pushing my powers down grows with each step. The iron of my armor begins to drag like lead. Though we walk slowly, I can't keep a steady pace. With time, I begin to fall behind. I hunch over, resting my hands on my knees. I just need to catch my breath. What are you doing? I snap up, ignoring how my curse spikes at the edge in Kao's voice. The tense... I gesture at the natural shelters before me. I was inspecting them. Unlike the metal poles and leathery hippone hides we use to build our tents, these are made with branches and coated in moss. In fact, there's a strange efficiency to their structure, techniques the army could adapt. It's hardly the time for rudimentary architecture. Kea narrows her eyes, focus on the task at hand. She turns on her heel, walking even faster, now that I've wasted her time. Wasted her time. I rush to follow, but as we near the carts and wagons, a stout woman catches my eye. Unlike the other campers, she isn't glaring. She isn't looking at us at all. Her attention is directed toward the bundle of blankets she cradles to her chest. Like a suppressed sneeze, my curse jumps to the surface. The mother's emotions hit like a smack to the face, sparks of rage, dull flashes of fear, but above all, a protectiveness burns, snarling like a snow leopard air guarding its only cub. I don't understand why until the bundle pressed against her chest begins to cry. A child. My eyes travel down the woman's chestnut skin to the jagged rock clasped in her hand. Her terror surges through my bones, but her resolve burns even stronger. Inan? I snap back to attention. I have to whenever Kea calls my name. But as I reach the merchant wagons, I glance back at the woman, shoving my purse down despite the way it makes my stomach burn. What does she have to fear, and what business would I have with her child? Wait. I stop Kea as we patch, pass a merchant, merchant wagon pulled by a one-horned cheat in airs. The spotted creatures gaze at me with orange eyes. Sharp fangs peek but from behind their black-lined lips. What? Turquoise cloud hangs around the doorway, bigger than the ones that have been appearing. This one is a wide selection. I try to keep my voice light as we approach. 
and the sea salt scent of the girl's soul. Though I fight my magic, her smell surrounds me when I pass through the cloud. The diviner appears in my mind, fully formed, dark skin almost luminescing in the Sokoto sun. The image lasts only a minute, but even a flicker makes my insides churn. The magic feeds like a parasite in my blood. I straighten my helmet as we walk through the wagon's door. Welcome, welcome. The wide smile of the elderly merchant drips from his dark face like wet paint. He stands, clenching the sides of the wagon for support. Kea shoves the scroll in his face. Have you seen this girl? The merchant squints and cleans his spectacles against his shirt, slowly buying time. He takes the sheet. I can't say I have. Droplets of sweat form on his brow. I glance at Kea. She notices, too. Doesn't take magic to tell this fool's lying. I walk around the small wagon, searching knocking over goods to get a rise. I spot a tear-shaped bottle of black dye and slip it into my pocket. For a while, the merchant stays still, too still for someone with nothing to hide. He tenses when, it, when I near a crate, crate, so I kick it down with my foot. Wooden splinters fly, an iron safe is revealed. Don't! Kea pushes the merchant against the wall and searches him, tossing a ring of keys my way. I test each in the lock of the hidden safe. How dare he lie to me! When the right key fits, I slam open the vault, expect expecting to find an incriminating clue. But then I spot the jewels of Amari's headdress. My breath catches in my throat. The sight takes me aback, bringing me to the days when we were kids. The days she first wore this, the moment I heard her. I wrap myself in the curtains of the palace infirmary. It's a fight to stifle my cries. As I cower, the physicians tending to Amari's wounds expose her back. My stomach twists when I see the sword slash. Red and raw, the cut rips across her spine. More and more blood leaks by the second. I'm sorry, I cry into the curtains, wincing every time the doctor's needles make her scream. I'm sorry, I ache to shout. I promise I'll never hurt you again. But no words leave my mouth. She lies on the bed, screaming, praying for the agony to end. And after hours, Amari lies numb, so drained she can't even speak. And as she moans, her handmaiden, Binta, slips into her bed, whispering something that draws a smile from Amari's lips. I listen and wa watch intently. Binta comfort co comforts Amari in a way none of us can. She sings her to sleep with her melodic voice, and when Amari slumbers, Binta takes mother's old dentin tiara, places it on Amari's head. Not a day passed when Amari didn't wear that tiara. The only fight with mother she ever won, it would take a gorillion to rip it off her head. For this to be here, my sister would have to be dead. I shove Kea aside and I thrust my blade against the merchant's neck. Inan! I silence Kea with my hand. This isn't the time for rank or discretion. Where did you get this? The, the girl gave it to me, the merchant croaks. Yesterday, I grabbed the parchment. Her? No, the merchant shakes his head. She was there. It was another girl. She had copper skin, bright eyes, eyes like yours. Amari. That means she's still alive. What did they buy? Kea interrupts. A sword, some canteens. Seems like they were going on a trip, like they were heading into the jungle. Kea's eyes widen. She rips the parchment out of my hands. It has to be the temple, Chan Noble. How close is it? A full day's ride, but let's depart. I grab the headdress and make for the door. If we ride fast, we can catch them. Wait, Kea calls. What shall we do with him? Please, the merchant trembles. I didn't know it was stolen. I pay my taxes on time. I'm loyal to the king. I hesitate, staring at the pitiful man. I know what I'm supposed to say. I know what my father would do. Inan, Kea asks. She puts her hands on her blade. I need to give the order. I can't show weakness. Duty before self. Please, the merchant begs, latching onto my hesitation. You can take my cart. You can take everything I have. He's seen too much, Kea cuts in. Just hold on, I hiss, pulse pounding in my ears. The burnt corpses of Lauren flash into my mind, the seared flesh. The crying child, do it, I push myself. One kingdom is worth more than one life, but too much blood has already been spilled, so much of it by my hands. And before I can say anything, the merchant sprints for the exit. One hand makes it to the door. Crimson explodes in the air. Blood spatters across my chest. The merchant tumbles to the ground, collapsing with a dense thud. Kea's throwing knife sticks out of the back of his neck, and after a shuddered breath, the merchant bleeds in silence. Kea's eyes me, eyes me as she bends down, extracting her knife. 
as if pulling the perfect rose from a garden. You mustn't tolerate those who get in your way, Inan. Kea steps over the corpse, wiping her blade clean, especially those who know too much. Chapter 17, Amari. A haze lifts from my mind as I blink into consciousness. My vision blurs the past and the present. For a moment, the silver of Binta's eyes shines, but when the hallucination passes, the flicker of candle flames dances along jagged stone walls. A rodent scurries by my feet, and I jolt back, and it's only then I realize I'm bound, tied to Zane and Zelly with unyielding ropes. Guys? Zelly stirs at my back. Sleep dripping from her voice, she twists and turns, but no matter how much she writhes, the ropes do not give. What happened? Zane's words slur together. He pulls, but even his considerable might doesn't loosen the rope's hold. For a while, his grunts are the only sounds in the cavern, but in, in time, another sound grows louder. We freeze as footsteps near. Your sword, Zelly hisses. Can you reach it? My fingers brush against Zelly's as I reach backward for my hilt, but I grasp only air. It's gone, I whisper back. Everything is. We scan the dimly lit cave, searching for the brass of my hilt, the gleam of Zelly's staff. Someone's taken all our things. We don't even have the... Scroll? A deep voice booms. I tense as a middle-aged man appears in the candlelight dressed in a sleeveless suede robe. White pearls and satyr patterns dot every inch of his dark skin. Zelly sucks in a quick breath. A centauro. A what? I whisper. Who's there? Zane growls, straining against the ropes to see. He bares his teeth in defiance. The mysterious man doesn't even blink. He leans against his staff, scarf carved from stone, gripping the face sculpted into its handle. An undeniable fury burns behind his golden eyes. I begin to think he won't move at all when suddenly he lurches forward. Zelly jumps as the man grasps a lock of her hair. Straight, he whispers with a hint of disappointment. Why? Get your hands off her, Zane yells. Though Zane poses no threat, the man steps back, releasing Zelly's hair. He pulls the scroll from the band of his robe and his golden eyes narrow. This was taken from my people years ago. His accent hums thick and heavy, different than the Orishan, Orishan dialects I've heard. I stare at the unraveled scroll in his hand, recognizing a few symbols on the parchment inked into his skin. They stole it from it from us. His voice takes a violent turn. I will not let you do the same. You are mistaken, I blurt out. We are not here to steal. Exactly what they said before. He wrinkles his nose at me. You stink of their blood. I draw back, shrinking into Zane's shoulders. The man looks at me with a hatred I cannot deflect. She's not lying, Zelly rushes out, voice powered with conviction. We're different. The gods sent us here. A seer guided us here. Mama Agba, I think back to her parting words. We're meant to do this, I want to cry out, but how can I argue that when right now all I wish was that I had never laid eyes on this, on this scroll? The Centauro's nostrils flare. He raises his arms and the air thrums with a threat of magic. He's going to kill us. My heart thrashes against my chest. This is where our journey ends. Father's old warning rings in my head. Against magic, we don't stand a chance. Against magic, we are defenseless. Against magic, we die. I saw what this used to be, Zelly chokes out. I saw the towers and temples, the Centauros who looked like you. The man brings his arms down slowly, and I know Zelly's caught his attention. She swallows hard. I pray to the sky she finds the right words. I know they came to your home, destroyed everything you love. They did the same thing to me, the thousands of people who look like me. Her voice cracks, and I close my eyes. Behind me, Zane goes rigid. My voice dries with the realization of who Zelly's talking about. I was right. Father destroyed this place. I think back to all the rubble, the cracked skulls, the hard look in Zelly's gaze, the peaceful village of Lauren up in flames, the tears streaming down Zane's face. The cascade of light that escaped Binta's palm fills my mind more beautiful than the sun's own rays. Where would I be now if Father had allowed Binta to live? What would all of Arisha look like if he had just given these magi a chance? Shame beats down on me, making me want to crawl into myself as the man raises his arms again. I squeeze my eyes shut in preparation for pain. The ropes vanish into thin air. Our belongings reappear by our sides. 
I'm still stunned by the magic when the mysterious man walks away, leaning on his staff. And as we rise, he utters a simple command, follow me.